So I'm happy to present you edit transactions today, which is a mechanism to circumvent some of the problems you might have in live programming. We are talking about live programming. In the context of this work, we will be talking about um, the environment which allows you to change and inspect the program as it's running. And additionally, you get immediate feedback. Like as you change, you can observe some change in the system continuously throughout your work. So this is what you find like programming throughout this talk. And you start with a very small example. So imagine you're drawing a simulation of a game, objects are moving around and this movement is right. controlled by a uh, static routine. Then put in the setting. Hmm? <laughs> setting we we just just move the object with a small part of the class here. And okay now this, this program is always running all the time, and we try to add a new feature. For example, gravity. So let's add a new method which will add some, some friction to the bottom of that ball. And okay, as you see, here it's the control slope, the will rest again now. And the moment you add a new method, your program that's already running will probably crash. Something you could have anticipated would happen now. This demonstrates that because we, yeah, we haven't defined the graph method yet. And this demonstrates that um, live programming from time to time can be quite fragile if you are actively using it while the program is running. And we address those problems with um, edit transactions, which is a mechanism to group a set of changes and apply them to the running program atomically when you're ready with that composite change. And let's see how this works. So when we had edit transactions, we could just, just put this uh, a started transaction, and when we, we added this step method of our wall object, then we would not immediately modify the case system, but we would just store a new version of the step method in our transaction for a moment. And then we can, if all the time we want, to implement our gravity, to our ball simulation or to our game as a new method, which also gets added to this transaction. So it's not visible to the basis, and the control flow is still here. But once we, when we decide that this is a positive change, we can activate it and we see a new field on the system, and the control flow is passing over here is consistent again. So we have activated all changes atomically while the program was running. And we can also like hit control set. Which doesn't just revert a single method, which would then like, fail again, but like deactivate the full transaction so we can we have a kind of semantic level of do and undo things. So let's look what, what edit transactions are. They, they are basically a layer which can add and remove certain objects from our base system. This object <coughs> will be called meta objects because uh, those are executable things in our runtime. And yeah, we always um, activate this um, edit transaction atomically. <laughs> so, wait. so another another important aspect of this is that the runtime only has a few of the system at the moment. So the base system will be unmodified, but control tool will see this queue depending on this kind of transaction type. So, in fact, the transactions are not just like diffs, like source code diffs on your running program, because they, con they contain the actual executable methods or executable meta objects in your runtime. So we have already compiled the actual method we have added in transactions. So we have already had to play like a syntax correct, did it compile. We could even run tests to that point without actually affecting the running program in the drive. So, what it, what it does is it intercepts the, the dispatch to those objects in the runtime. So, when you look up, for example, this reflect method, then it will map the name to that new version of that method. And if we look up the step method, then we will cancel dispatch because we have removed the step method inside this transaction. And 
So we can also think of edit transactions as a mechanism to remap or unmap or, or access to, to executable meta objects at runtime. So let's look at this from a conceptual perspective. So in our runtime we have our meta objects, like for example methods, classes, fields, and things like that, which is executable. And then we have this editor, which has a representation of those meta objects which we edit. This can be source code, this can be a graph, or whatever is projecting on this thing, for example. And whenever we change something in the editor, then this would probably have an effect on some meta object, updated meta object. And this happens with a certain fixed granularity. This granularity is given by the system. For example, in small systems, this granularity is a single method. So whenever you save a new method, then this whole method is updated. So, we call this adaptation. It is the phase in which we translate a change in the editor to a change in the runtime system or in our executable view of the program. And eventually, our control flow will reach those meta objects, for example, by calling those methods. And we eventually see that change. And this, this phase of the, the control for reaching our change and being visible to the program is what we call emergence in this case. And what edit transactions do? is they still preserve this adaptation. So you can do a couple of changes and collect them as executable meta objects in the runtime. You can run tests on them, you can inspect them, you get feedback whether it's compiled or not. But it doesn't it isn't visible to the control flow at that moment. Only when you decide to atomically activate the edit transaction, then you will have emergence. So edit transactions are a mechanism to decouple this adaptation and emergence in live programming environments. So, yeah, what, what it effectively does is changing this, um, that granularity given by the system to a semantic granularity which <coughs> is used itself as a program. And when we, when we have an edit transaction, we, we first of all we want to create it to indicate to the system that we are working with edit transactions. And then there are two orthogonal concepts which I explain now. The first is a the property of an edit transaction to be staged or unstaged. Staged means that this transaction is currently recording our changes. So when we, when we modify source code or anything, then this change will be collected by an edit transaction, not affect the base system at the moment. So if it's unstaged, then this edit transaction is ignored by the protocol. Then there is the concept of activation. When we have our staged um, we have put a lot of changes in our staged um, transaction and we activate it, then this is the point where all these changes yeah. get visible to the runtime atomically, to the running program. And we can also uh, deactivate this change in the inactive transaction. Yeah. And staging and unstaging is something which we which you can do on a per editor basis. Like in particular editor, when you do a change, you would stage the transaction inside <coughs> that editor. And active or inactive is a property of the thread, the runtime which is currently executing the program. To make this, um, yeah. And well, if you're working with the system, eventually you are done with your change, and you want to become the changes permanent part of your system again. This is what we call merge. Like the source code gets like merged back into the base system and is not distinguishable anymore. <coughs> or we could just, just delete all the changes we have and collect them in the edit transaction. So, those are the problems we are dealing with with edit transactions. And if an edit transaction is only staged, as we have said, um, the editor will only see the change but not the runtime. So, we can do like all types of static analysis on these objects or already see if it compiles. And we can activate an edit transaction, for example, for only a small control flow, like, like this small talk snippet here, which indicates that this block gets executed with a certain edit transaction, which means that, for example, you can run tests in that block. So you can test the system under your new changes without the rest of the system noticing there are new changes. Or you could just um, activate it for a thread, which means you can promptly push the change to a thread. Or activate globally, which means like all of your reference system will now be able to, to see this change. Okay, so what types of objects do we recall?
important that transactions for pretty much every has been remove operation of a meter object. So if you add or remove the class method function <coughs> here in an object or in system, for example, we call that operation. We also do some shortcuts, for example, if you rename something, we can just remove the old version as a new version. Or if we update the implementation of the method, then we can just remove the old version and have like the updated version of the Zoscript of the compiled method to our system. And we have a couple of challenges when we, we are working with those transactions. So one of the challenges would be when is it safe to, to activate it in control flow? Like when does it cause the the least um, disruption to our system? And then of course we want to, to compose multiple transactions. So you have a change and in the change we start like sort of a nested transaction. It doesn't really work, right? <laughs> Yeah. And we want um, the scope added to section of like everything, not the scope added to single, single threads, for example. So, what happens if an instance is shared by two threads? Like one thread where the added transaction is already active, and one thread where we have no change made to the class of that object. Like, how does that object behave in those different scenarios? So, for example, when we when you have a variable or an instance variable modified at that object or created a new method, how do these objects behave then? So, let's first look at where might be a good idea to activate those transactions. And you'll see there's a problem on this little um, example. So, assume you have a method A. And this method A calls method B. So, this is kind of the runtime direction here. And it calls B twice, and then A is called again a couple of times. So we have an edit transaction which changes method A and method B. We want to assume activate that change at this point in time, which means we have A and B on the call stack. So I could have multiple ways to resolve this conflict. And the first would be I just, just replace A and B by the new versions in the edit transaction, which would end up with this control flow. Like the old A would then eventually call the new B, but new B would then recoil in the old A and only the new A is invoked when an A is called again. So this is not really what we call atomic. You would also end up, if this was a recursion, you would end up with multiple versions of the same method on your on your call stack if you start a debugger, that's not what we want. <coughs> this is better would be to wait until all methods return, which are affected by this edit string, before we actually can activate it. So we defer activation until this point, and then we have both changes in version atomically. This is what we call re-enter atomicity. And there's also something which, which, would, which would take some efforts from the programmer itself. So if it defines um, like critical sections where things should not be activated, then we could not just wait until a, such a breakpoint or save point is reached and then activate pending transactions. But this would require a programming intervention. So, because we do not want it, and this is a little bit too non atomic for us, we go with that as a default option and yeah, get this, this single version of stick whenever we activate a couple of changes automatically. So, Next change, uh, next challenge would be <coughs> to ensure the safe composition of those edit transactions. <coughs> okay, so this is the base system, and this is the, the view the runtime has on that system. And we will now add certain edit transactions which removes the step method and adds a move method to our board class. So in the in the view, the board will now only have the move method, not the step method anymore. Then on top of that, we make another change and just revert what we have done before. So we add a step method and delete the move method again, record that as an edit transaction and activate it. So we see this view in the runtime again. But then we make another change, which is deleting the step method. So I will have no methods at the moment. So we have said that we can activate and deactivate edit transactions. What happens if you deactivate this one? So what we decided to do in this case was to resolve conflicts like in the easiest way possible. So if you add something which already existed, then 
So basically, it shadows that object. And if you remove something which did not exist, then this does not have that. So it gets a little bit more complicated if you start removing objects with a, which have been added twice. Like for example, you have the add method. Maybe here we have a uh, set method. Maybe here we have removed it before, but that edit method actually doesn't exist anymore. So we just accidentally dump here as the uh, step method and then remove it once. So one solution would be to make this deletion cancel out this addition, which would then expose the old step method again, which would come as a surprise to most programmers. So we decide that if there is a single delete on top of the stack of um, our lookup chain, we will just block access to all versions which have been before. So this is the last thing the programmer wanted to do, to delete that thing. So it would be like, surprising to have that pop up. So let's look at how state is handled in those um, edit transactions. So think of our four files. We have our position encoded as an X and Y field. Um, then on the right side, you will see some code running in a single instance of this object. For example, we would have this code which assigns x to the one inside that instance. But then we <coughs> can remove x and y and add the refactory to so want to have a position point instead of both of the separately the object. So we put that change into an edit transaction and activate it. So now we can't reach x anymore because it's, it's gone. That's been deleted with my programs. But you can set the position to this is a small talk point again. X being one, one being two. And then you maybe somewhat later in the system you could, for example, remove that method but then add a field X in again. So this is a new X. This is not the old X we have deleted over here. Because we have deleted it. So we shouldn't be able to read X again at this point. We also shouldn't be able to read position because it has been deleted by the programmer. But we can set x to a new value, for example, 10. Now we decide that those changes are, are not very good, so we undo them. We deactivate the edit transactions. Oh, and x is 1 again. Because now we are back to our base system, and we have to bound to this x, so we can read this x now. And if we activate this edit transaction again, then we will see that our position is there, if you have to activate the final edit transaction with re adds x, and we will see that um, x is 10 again. So basically, it does not matter in, in which composition of threads this object will be accessed. And depending on which edit transactions are active in that respective thread, we will resolve the state to like the most, most recent state of the fields. And internally, we don't migrate instances. We only project a new view on those instances. So you said edit transactions are capable of, of renaming things, of mapping the name to another location or to another meta object. So this is what happens here. The name position is not mapped to an additional field in this <coughs> instance, but to a field in a separate storage, which is kept by our transaction management. And the X body here is mapped to, to this field to prevent it from overwriting what actually happens in the instance. We just want to be able to switch between edit transactions fast. So we choose this approach <coughs> of migrating instances during runtime. So from the compiler side of you, we have to do late binding. So this is very small talk specific now, because those variables are not late all the runtime. We have to introduce some kind of late binding, which means instead of uh, assigning to the variable, we introduce a call to our storage manager to set this variable at our instance to certain expression or to a certain value. And if we read that value, we ask our storage manager for that value for that specific instance. And here what happens at runtime is that this global storage object will ask the active process which edit transactions are currently active. So we've seen this could be a stack of multiple transactions. So we traverse the stack in the top, top entry as an entry for our instance. And in that instance, we have an entry for our variable and this is the value we get when we need it. So 
this is so the interaction between between the compiler side changes and the, the runtime will be when we choose to use editor um, Okay, if looking at method dispatch or message dispatch, we have the following implementation idea. So in Smalltalk, a class with methods has a so-called method dictionary, a method dict object, which maps the name of the method to the respective compiled version of that method. So that compiled version version basically contains a binary of codes executable by the virtual machine. And when we have a staged edit principle and want to add a change, for example to the move method, then we need to copy over the old method because whenever that edit action is not active, we want to dispatch to the old one, but when it's active, we want to dispatch to the new one. So our compiled method basically gets replaced by a larger method which knows all the versions and <coughs> if, it, if this method actually gets caught, then again it will resolve and go through the active process, read the activation stack of edit transactions, see okay, there is no reason for this edit transaction, so maybe we continue down the stack, and see we have a version for this edit transaction and execute this bytecode over here instead of the old version of this transaction. So we have evaluated these mechanisms with a case study which has some interesting insights I'm, I'm going to talk about later. But first we'll have a look at what we could do in, in terms of tools, like showing a small editor using <coughs> those edit transactions. And then we'll present a small case study in which the programmer is told to modify a multi-agent simulation. So this is um, it's made look familiar if you, if you know small complex systems. So this is a browser and this write up is basically what we know from from non small browsers. Like a few categories, select like categories, you see the classes which are in there, you can select the class, you see the methods, and this is the source code of the method. So you can like <coughs> just edit the source code over here. For the edit tool, the standard small editor is just a view of edit transactions you can give to the name, and you can stage and unstage them. So these are the staged edit transactions, those are the, the unstaged edit transactions at the moment. You can just like drop them and use the buttons to do this, and also you have a chance to activate and deactivate them. Doing buttons could also be like keyboard shortcuts. Like. So, with the tool, this is um, our simulation. So, there are a couple of, of agents being simulated on a virtual world. And those, those agents with the screen, screen points here interact with each other, and with certain probability, they transmit. An infection like a disease, and we are trying to stimulate the spread of the disease over the map. And there are also some, some errors transporting agents from other, other destinations on the world. So the task is now to add recovery to those agents. Which means you have to edit this, this um, simulation and you want the simulation to be running. So one, one observation you could do of this is our editor, we have broken one agent. We have done a serial division here. So there are a couple of debuggers, what has happened. Well, we have broken the agent class, and our world dispatches to one agent to <coughs> kind of update it here, or to, to step that agent. And the exception happens, and we have a debugger. And this happens a couple of times. So what we have done with edit transactions, when you, when you make a mistake, you work at one debugger, but the simulation is still running. What has happened? Well, our agent is only modified within an edit transaction. And if an edit transaction fails, then we have stack unwinding, and during stack unwinding, we peel the transaction off the stack into the debugger. So we can debug the, we can debug the edit transaction without agents being infected anymore, and the dispatch now is okay, because the dispatch is to the old version. Another thing we often observe in this case study is that we resort to um, lazy initialization because constructor code is only evaluated once in the system. So if you edit your instance variable, it will be here and we'll have to initialize it ad hoc from the user first. And another, another thing is that um, edit transactions are capable of like, relieving us from, from using multiple windows in our environment because in almost small time you would probably, when you edit a method, and encounter it, you cannot save that method because it would probably break the system, then you start a new window and kind of 
fix the dependency over here, and then you save it in the correct order. So what you can now do is you just operate in a single window because you have the edit transaction, which you can save and unsave and activate and deactivate. So this is the kind of things we observed in, in workflow changes when edit transactions are in the system. So to conclude this talk, <coughs> edit transactions are a mechanism to decouple the adaptation and emergence in live programming environments. They allow a semantic granularity of change rather than what the system dictates it to use as a granularity. And but they trade a little bit of immediacy for that property. So I'm ready to take the questions now. Changes on like meter objects, not the actual objects. Ah, 